is make or break this weekend for the HGC teams as we look toward clash qualification. Here in North America, four different teams all have a possibility of clinching a spot, but I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. Team Gilly Howe here to bring you all of North America. And Jay Howe, if there was a previously on HGC North America talking about what happened last weekend, we'd see a whole lot of clips about a certain series that felt pretty cliffhangery between Heroes Hearth and Team 12. Our Heroes Hearth and Team 12 are cap off last weekend. It was the big show and it was Team 12 that's supposed to be near the top and it's Heroes Hearth that says, hey, we're on the rise too. And Heroes Hearth pulled off what we would consider an upset at the time, but their stock is trending really high right now. That was a heck of a series we had. Yeah, and that series has huge implications now when we talk about the standings of North America. Let's get a few logistics out of the way. Team Freedom has two series this weekend. Win one, they qualify for the Western Clash. That could happen today. Tempo Storm has one series versus LFM. Win that, they're going to the Clash too. Heroes Hearth has two series this weekend. Win them both with Tempo Storm getting a win over LFM. They'll be joining them at their first international event. But Jay how things start to get a little dicey when we talk about Team 12. Yeah, Team 12, the upset that happened last week with Heroes Hearth. When you think about Team 12, they have to win their matchup against Team Freedom this weekend, plus a few other things. But if they don't, because they've played five of their seven already heading into this weekend, they could potentially fall to the final qualifying spot next weekend. And there's even an outside shot they might not qualify. So this weekend has very big implications. Yeah, it's a big deal for Team 12. It's a big deal for all of those teams as they've got their eyes on being able to qualify and the first team to qualify for the Western Clash as we look at the schedule was earlier today in Europe. Team Dignitas, congratulations. Even though they finally lost a single game, they still look dominant and they claimed the first Western Clash spot. Zealots, they keep their hopes alive with a narrow victory over Diamond Skin. Uh, in a bit, we'll see if Team Freedom can get a win over Space Station to join Team Dignitas at the Western Clash. But first, who are the true old gods? Is it McIntyre? Is it Arthlon from Heroes Hearth Esports? Or is it Simplicity themselves? Speaking of Simplicity, Gilly, on that side of the coin is King Caffeine, who I had the pleasure of talking with this week. And he really spoke about the way this team is starting to come together despite the results haven't been there. And I asked him about, hey, you know, these teams have very uh, – a lot of similarities when you right. look at very old school type styles and he said that there is a lot of similarities he recognized that he just feels that his team might have the upper hand this week well as heroes hearth uh, we talked about they have the possibility of being able to qualify but they need to win both of their series this weekend and both of those series they're facing old demons we're talking about mcintyre versus old Naventic roster uh arthalon versus old cloud nine and then on sunday crowen versus gale force esports but if they're able to defeat those old demons, if they settle those scores, then it will be Heroes Hearth that go from Crucible all the way to Western Clash. But let's see what Simplicity have to say about that as we head into our first match of the weekend. Simplicity is very interesting to me because they have a lot of very strong players. And that's a large part in why I'm not trying to take this series lightly or any series lightly. Simplicity, they perform well in tournaments. They have members like King Caffeine, K1 Pro, Zuna, all have been on top teams before, and so they know how to perform. I think, again, not to take uh, Simplicity lightly because they are a very dominant team when they want to be. That team is traditionally you know, very strong at team fighting. As long as we're able to play well and play what we want, then we will be able to win the series. Our series against Heroes Hearth is going to be really rough. Um, I think we're pretty evenly matched teams, and for us to get out on top, we're really going to have to buckle down and uh, get our late game rotation strong and our draft strong. I do think they have a limited hero pool um, compared to some of the other teams, so that is something we're going to try to use to our advantage and try to pigeonhole them into specific comps and then prepare counters. Um, it should be an interesting series because we both like a lot of the same picks and we both have a lot of that meta knowledge and old school uh, draft info. Whoever comes out top is just going to come down to whoever executes better. As 
we've been talking about, there has been a drastic shift in story for Heroes Hearth Esports ever since they had that huge upset, or what we perceived as an upset, they maybe not so much, over Team 12 last weekend. And that, of course, can be attributed to the stellar, phenomenal growth that we have seen from Heroes Hearth every single week. Yeah, and a big part of that, when we looked at their opening schedule, they had a tough schedule, but a lot of that kind of fell to the fact that they were dying a lot. There was a lot of deaths going on, despite some success in terms of getting kills and the hero damage, the continuity there in terms of staying alive and doing more with it wasn't there with Heroes Hearth. And if, when I've looked at the stats throughout this past week, they've dropped significantly. When you look at Ishbu, when you look at McIntyre, and you look at Crowan, they've all dropped in terms of those deaths per game. And that's a big part for them is getting over that big hump in the early part of the season against some of the top teams. Now we're seeing them start to round into a much more truer form that we kind of expected coming in. And for simplicity, that growth hasn't quite been there the way that they we know that they have been wanting. King Caffeine's talked about trying to improve their macro to go along with their phenomenal team fighting. It's just that it hasn't quite been there yet, and I expect them to still have difficulties if it's not there because of how well Heroes Hearth were able to run the map, control the map versus Team 12 using a lot of their globals. And this first battleground is one of the places where Heroes Hearth did just that versus Team 12. We're going to Towers of Doom, chosen by Heroes Hearth Esports. We get bans on Braxis Holdout. That is the standard ban for both of these teams, which gives a little flexibility to Simplicity because Heroes Hearth had the pick ban first for maps. Heroes Hearth keep with Braxis. Simplicity gets to take away Tomb. That's one of the favored battlegrounds, the two that we see for Heroes Hearth. So we're going to have to see Heroes Hearth flex it out a little bit. Heroes Hearth 3 and 1 on Tomb of the Spider Queen so far. It's been definitely one of their more favorable battlegrounds, and some where they've pulled off their win against Tempo Stormo, by the way, during that opening week. And that's kind of where they've been known to shine. Hanzo and Greymane in particular for Crowan, especially on those maps. So no surprise there, but Towers of Doom obviously does bring up the more team fighting style when you look at that, when you're on the side of simplicity, because there's altars, there's, you're not pushing towards the core, so most of it revolves around team fights, although macro can influence quite a bit with this. Yeah, for Heroes Hearth, they, the, a big reason why their growth has been so phenomenal week to week is because they stick with strategies they know. They have a lot of flexibility, and they're willing to flex to try to counter opponent's drafts, but they seem to be strongest when they stick to the game plans, when they play their Tassadar Hanzo Diablo, when they played the Globals on this map, versus Team 12. Simplicity also like Globals in general on this map, but they also really want to be able to get into those team fights. We'll see what kind of picks they get and where things like Dahaka, the Falstaff, the Abathur, where those things fall. The Abathur, I think for me, Gilly, is going to be the biggest part of, t of Towers of Doom here. And before we can even really kind of get it out of there, I mean, we have great Abathur players on both teams, and both of them have strategies that revolve around amplifying one of those, whether it's a gray main style or a potential Hanzo. With Simplicity coming out, Hanzo been here. This has been Hosties most played. But on the other side, on the flip side, it's also been Crowan. So it'd be hard to imagine Simplicity would pass this up here. But Simplicity did say that they were going to be looking to target hero pools. And a lot of that does start and end with Hanzo, gray main, Genji. They took Genji. One of the other two will be let through here going over to Heroes Art. Yeah, I would anticipate the Hanzo. Crone is undefeated with the hero, 6-0. and oh. It's not just the Hanzo, it's how the team revolves and plays around things like that Dragon's Arrow, starting out the fights for them. And the even the Tassadar and the Diablo to go with it, being able to get combos around the Apocalypse after Dragon's Arrow, just being able to constantly drop down the Force Wall, get the slam into that. Ishbu is a monster with Diablo, so I would think that maybe trying to dissuade that strategy would be where Simplicity goes, but no, they're going to take Tyrael, and we've seen a, a big uptick in Tyrael picks, but uh, very quick to <laughs> Haka Hanzo. You know, when we talked to Crow and right at the, the end of the series last time, when I asked him Hanzo or Grey Main early on in the previous week, he said Grey Main. When I asked him this past week, he said Hanzo. Now, one thing that obviously pairs well is the Tyrael Grey Main, so obviously it seems like Simplicity might go down that route. You know, I talked about it a little bit last week with the Zuna style play. When he's on the more, I have to stay in the back line ranged heroes instead of ones that could potentially dive, like a gray main. It seems like their success is higher when he plays those style of heroes. When he gets onto the gray main, he gets very aggressive. When he's on the Janna who doesn't have the mobility, he likes to make aggressive plays. Those have been two kind of sore spots, I think, when it comes to their team fighting. And I'd be curious to see if they're willing to change that up here with Greymane being let through and the Tyrael obviously being picked up, if they're willing to commit to that and if it will be Zuna on that hero. 
They have played double reset here too, so it's not just about the uh, the gray main considering too. Although seeing an ETC, yeah, they're gonna pair that up with the gray main. So they have the gray main anterior duo synergy, and then also potentially the ETC Tyrael too, but ETC also brings in a possible global for the team, yeah. where with that high Dahaka pick, for, uh, for Heroes Heart, Simplicity might have been hurting for those globals. And it's one of those things that you, Tyrael's actually a little bit better of a solo laner in the early part of the game, and then once you see 10 hit, then it switches over to ETC because he has that global. So you can you can use the early game kill potential of ETC, maybe go for some hard invades, get that CC lockdown. And so that's definitely something that comes in. Heroes Hearth, they're hovering Stukov. That is K1 Pro's most played hero, sitting at 50% in six games. I don't necessarily feel it as strongly here, but they are going with that band nonetheless to target the potential hero pool of K1 Pro. Yeah, it a, a, can be a difficult hero to play against on Towers of Doom anyway, just because of the silence of the sappers with the kind of composition that Simplicity are already starting to run. Stukov adds to that really well. Uh, in general, it feels like he's fallen off a lot for Simplicity. Yeah. It was a lot more uh, favored. It still is most played, but it was a lot more favored toward his earlier First series. Few weeks, yeah. But I can still see not wanting to have to play against that. That silence can be just absolutely punishing to a team. Well, we heard from King Caffeine that they would potentially target the hero pools of Heroes Hearth. And one thing that you can look at in particular, in the 15 games that Heroes Hearth has played... Are you talking about BBJ? Talk about BBJ. All right, all right. I think you know where I'm going with this. Yeah, there's a lot of Uther Rhaegar plays. Seven Uther, five Rhaegar games. Yeah. 12 of the 15 games have been on two supports. I feel that that trend will potentially continue here. But then when we see what they've traditionally ran, if you're Simplicity, the Hanzo's already locked in. Are you going to take the Uther out of the equation? Are you going to take the Tassadar? Are you going to take the Diablo? Or just take the Lucio out of a potential equation? That's He's played two games of Lucio. He has. And it's, it's more so a, it feels like the idea of this big burst heal or this enabling divine shield is just where Heroes Hearth want to go. BBJ plays as the enabler for either McIntyre, for Crowan, and being able to play one of those two heroes. I don't think that we'll see any adjustment here, at least for game one, to see him switch off of that, but we'll have to see how much that Lucio ban actually hurt them. It's an interesting one to see from Simplicity, though. It makes me think it's a lot more about Simplicity's plan of where they want to go with the rest of their draft, just considering like they can see how much Uther and Rhaegar BBJ has been playing. The light abandons Get the Falstaff coming out here, and we're we're pretty established a little bit in where Heroes Hearth is going, but if you go back to the open division days, this is something that McIntyre could actually flex over into. But I think that with Dahaka there, it'll likely be him. But the flexibility of this, it's definitely probably going to be Arthalon. But I, I wouldn't put it past Heroes Hearth to maybe mix things up at times. But I feel like where we're at now feels a bit more settled. Simplicity. You know, I thought maybe they were going to try to flex over to Malfail. We've see been seeing a lot more teams be willing to play these triple melee compositions. Um, Tempo Storm, but other teams have started to pick it up more too. Team 12 with Cure playing Tyrael. I don't know if Simplicity feels like they have the ability to do that right now with who is playing what. I think they do feel like they're on the more flexible side of things with all of these old players who have played a lot of different roles. Um, but in taking Tyrael, banning Lucio, you've, you've gotten rid of a lot of the big counters for Tormented Souls. Ah, Lunara to punish the Uther. I love it. Brilliant. And then a Malfurion to close out the, uh, the draft. Malfurion's actually been one of the best counters in terms of supports. Uther and Malfurion against the Hanzo have had the best success of all supports out there. So I love the pick. Malfurion obviously is strong in a lot of regards. Lunara has kind of been the thing. Targeting the hero pools is actually, is actually countering those. And the Lunara, I spoke about it a little bit when the league started. I was like, oh, wonderful to see some Lunara start to creep in as Uther started to come back in. Now we get it here. Lunara, great pickup against the, the individual heals there of Uther. Dahaka does have a self heal. So if you're here on the front side, it'd be worth Worth considering something potentially an Arthas to control that front line, maybe keep it standard with Murden. Yeah, there's been a lot more of those niche pickups of Lunara in Europe, though Cure played it one time for Team 12. I think we've had it maybe one other time as that Murden does get locked in. But when she is picked in her niche spot in a situation like this versus an Uther who can't quite keep up with his long cooldowns with those heals, uh, Lunara has been very effective. We're looking at a 73% win rate internationally for Lunara, and she's she's not picked that often. So it's teams really know where her place lies 
And this is one of those places where it looks good for Simplicity to bring in Lunara. Post level seven Lunara, Splintered Spear against Oof. an Uther. I mean, if you're if you're playing out there in draft mode and you see Uther on the other side, and you're like, oh, look, I can play a little bit of Uther. I can make him beg for mercy. And you can just sit there, go Splintered Spear, and just the minute you get that, there's the little tricks, you know, you can actually use it. It, it has an individual proc. So you can actually queue somewhere else, run across the map, attack, and then by the time that's up, queue again. As you get back to back, it's a little sneaky way of playing Lunara. So it's it's a fun way to play, I think, against an Uther. I, I love it. Lunara is one of my most fun heroes, especially to punish something like that. Not so much against Lucio, who they banned out. Right. It was uh, well done by Simplicity to make sure to sneak that Lunara in there. But it still does feel very team fight focused for Simplicity. We know that's been a focus for them before. Yeah. And with Heroes Hearth having a double global, I'm a little bit fearful that they're never really going to be able to get into the situation for those team fights. Uh, we'll have to see. We're ready to load into the game, though. We're going to Towers of Doom for game one between Heroes Hearth Esports and Simplicity. Something about this matchup just gets me really excited to start today. I don't know what it is. It's all the names maybe on both sides, so the potential here. Names. Like, I'm excited for this. I mean, this is this is kind of what you want to open the day with when you see this. And on the left side, it will be Hero's Hearth, as it is going to be Crowen on Hanzo, of course, McIntyre on Dahaka, BBJ one more time on Uther, Ishbu on Muradin, and Arthalon on the false deck. And for Simplicity in the red, we've got Hosty. He's going to be playing that Lunara. K1 Pro, new support player on Malfury and King Caffeine. Rocking out the Tyrael. Zuna will be playing Greymane and ETC played by Airho. So there's some couple things to keep in mind here. Airho playing the ETC indeed it does make it feel like this will be more of the echo pedal, but for sure the stage dive type play of ETC that Jeho mentioned later on switching on over and being the solo laner. We'll see if he wants to do that right from the start or if King Caffeine will be doing that. Also the wingman that we've seen once before from Hero's Heart. This is all about camp control. You've got Hanzo with the scatter arrow build that he's already building into. Get to four there, a lot of control over the bottom. Falstad heading to the top along with the Dahaka, you have control over the top. This is a camp controlling composition for Heroes Hearth. I think you bring up an excellent point to be able to rotate to that top lane, control that, and then use both globals to potentially go down for a gank, steal the bottom and get that bottom lane control. I love the point that you made there. So we'll see how that plays out. Ishbu disrupting the rotations here of Simplicity. Toasty getting a little bit of poke in. Now the Globals are going to be in the top and the mid, while Heroes Hearth does what they can to slow down the rotations. You can see that Muradin has been doing that. Ishbu just doing uh, what he can do on that safer pick to uh, have as an anchoring person to slow the rotations. But the first Sapper Camps has spawned. Both teams heading straight on over. Simplicity slightly ahead in that regard, though. As, uh, again, there's no level four yet to have the serrated arrows to make these uh, camps go down faster. This might <laughs> be something that Simplicity can take advantage of. They're just now getting the camp, though, and Heroes are they're almost there. Should be able to pick that up, no problem. It's amazing how different that looks post-level four. Right? <laughs> it's just <laughs> like, all right, well, it's just slow and steady, but uh, it will play out in the long run. And here's the global you mentioned already in effect, Gilly. I mean, they're using both top. McIntyre, of course, has that speed boost once he goes through the the brush there. Yeah, and it takes ETC a little bit of time to where he can really try to keep up with that. There's no Tyrael in the top using that Justice for All as the shielders to hold that lane uh, more. So it's up to Simplicity to make sure that they're getting a lot done here in other lanes as a result. The hosty harassment here has been outstanding. That skirmish there looked fine for a second, and then he got a few auto attacks in on a couple of heroes, press W, got a few more in on Hanzo. I mean, that is very, uh, that, that's what you have to do. It, you're not gonna win it with burst with a Lunara. If you get him down like that, let Greymane be the finisher. And that's the part that I worry about is will Zuna try and go in a little bit too early? He's got the Lunara there. Hopefully that's something they've practiced a little bit coming into this. Have him pepper them down. You have the frontline control, and when it's time, you have ETC Tyrael to dive in. There's a lot of ways Simplicity can win these team fights, especially, again, post-level 7. Yeah, even if Zuna wants to play more aggressively, he has the diving buddy of Tyrael, and he has the peels to help with ETC too. It's very likely that we see, I, I don't know if we'll see a Thornwood Vine or a Leaping Strike, maybe Leaping Strike because of the Dahaka stocks, but Hosty in the past, when we do get his Lunara, it's a rare treat, but it is a treat because he plays a mean Lunara, and I do mean lean as mean as he is doing a number to Ishbu. McIntyre's gonna stalk in, gets the drag, catches, takes out Tyrael for first blood. First blood, and 
credit to him. That was threading the needle there. Zuna going in trying to get the kill. Instead, he's getting stunned and locked down. That's the second kill there. But Gilly, one of the biggest talking points we had last week was McIntyre's superb play. It was off the charts good in their series against Team 12. He came in there, brush stalkered. You saw King Caffeine, he got stunned a little bit. And then there were three people clumped up. Oh, well, wait a minute, Arthlon might be in trouble here. Oop yes, the slow still had barrel roll. He was very patient with that, waiting it out until the team could come in for the help too. Please continue. But yeah, the, the way he threaded the needle, it's just a continued oh. play. He's actually gonna go down here. They stepped a little bit too far forward there, but the McIntyre play as of late has been really, really good. Yeah, his Malfeo, last week was the first time we saw his Dahaka too. He's been putting on a clinic now in that solo lane. Ishbu getting the continual slow and the continual poison. BBJ doing what he can. And we didn't see the wave of light build for BBJ. Still building into more having a hammer of justice up more often. Having that hammer of the light bringer and then the movement speed of pursuit of justice. Uh, wondered if maybe we'd see that adjustment for wave of light. Just trying to get the cooldown reduction so that he can uh, heal up and try to deal more with the splinter and spear action that is now going to be going on with Lunara. But that's not the case. It's going to go from bad to worse in terms of that damage. So it will be on to Hero's Hearth to potentially try and initiate in some of these situations. You can take a few auto attacks as Murden. You've got a lot of potential with Avatar. Dahaka can heal up. But it will eventually mount up and make it very difficult. So long as Simplicity kind of plays that steady Lunara pace, they will win out those trades. And speaking of winning out trades, the Global's up there trying to take care of Urho, unable to do so. But Gilly, to the point you made to start the game, they're controlling that top camp. Yeah, and the flight was used for that. So I'm not sure what Heroes Earth plans to do about this bottom lane. The altar spawning in 10 seconds and their sappers running in. But they get the camp. They may just choose to push along with that. Keep false set up at the top and let Dahaka use that movement speed advantage that you get from Brush Shocker to start him rotating down. They're going to keep an eye on it. They're very caught up in experience. So everything is um, just fine and dandy there. It's a very slow start to this altar phase, though. Wishbu going in heavy there, and Dahaka is not able to make it down. He does have that extra movement speed, but he doesn't have enough essence yet to really kind of capitalize on that. Instead, McIntyre pathing right through the middle. Falset is now within uh, range of being able to walk in. There's no stage dive yet, so ETC has to start the go down too. This Posty is... Posty fine with the Nature's Cure used to, to get him out of danger there, and it was absolutely necessary as McIntyre was out for blood. This is almost exactly where Krohn likes to be on Hanzo because you can just kind of casually poke, continue your quest, which you've actually already completed, but just bounce off walls. Simple geometry. Falstad? There's a lot of members from Simplicity in the mid there on Falstad. Arthalon receives the tail end of that Holy Radiance, though BBJ and pathing through will undoubtedly fall. Has a little bit of heals for a little while. Heroes Hearth got aggressive on the other side of that fight, trying to see if they could trade out on kills, but Simplicity has been finding openings, finding opportunities to get some kills there, and as a result, takes this altar. All poison, all the time. I mean, I, I'm getting a sneak peek. Lunara already has 28,000 damage. Next highest in the game is 15,000 by Hanzo. I mean, just... This is Lunara in a nutshell against an Uther, and that's when Simplicity mentioned having the... Does he get the interrupt? Ooh, that was a <laughs> little close for comfort for Arthalon when he flew out. It was great awareness from him to try to make sure that everything else had been used, but I do have to say Arthalon a couple of times now has been getting caught from Simplicity, and that's honestly something that Simplicity has had to deal with quite a lot in other series, so it's nice to see Simplicity sort of be the aggressors on this. Airho's on a tankier pick there, though generally he does play the secondary tanks, but it's often that teams are able to try to catch him out, especially around objectives. And in this case, he's bringing the fight to one of the two solo laners, maybe the one who's generally a little less comfortable being a solo laner for Hero's Heart, and that's Arthalon. It's definitely something you can take advantage of. And Urho, again, staying up in the top, that's slowly whittling down. McIntyre, afraid of the rotation, doesn't have eyes just yet, or maybe he's got some other things in mind. But getting that top lane control, if you can get that and then turn it into bottom lane control, that's where the advantages lie. With the next altar in the bottom, Arthalon and McIntyre will have a little bit of attention to detail here in the top lane. Urho with the global does help. 
But McIntyre, there he is. There's the wingman stacks. Now, if they could get that bell tower down and start to wrestle control away, no matter what happens on the altar, unless it's a team wipe on the side of Hero's Hearth, this is actually a really big power play for Hero's Hearth. Yeah, there's two choices. Either Hero's Hearth keeps their globals up there to keep ETC up there so that he can stop, or they bring the globals down now, knowing that ETC has to stay there, and they try to go for a kill, and that's what they did. They went after King Caffeine, but he stays alive. Now, the stage dive in from Arrow 2. Ardalon flew in, and it's a full 5v5 battle over this uh, altar. Ishbu got just assaulted there, forcing to go back, taking all of that damage. There's the tongue landing onto ETC. They don't have the big burst damage, and Zuna's on the backside very deep, Gilly. Yeah, the two globals are going to try to handle that, but he gets knocked out of the dwarf toss. Great job by Airho from that. Twilight Dream comes in as Greymane goes down. And though the silences and the poisons are starting to put the hurting onto Hero's Heart's health bars, they're going to go back in for more. They're going in. They do not get the interrupt. Just missing there. They're going to try and get a kill. The shielding coming in there to help out Simplicity. And right now, Simplicity's got themselves a little bit of a lead despite that kill. I mean, Hero's Hearth finds themselves a little bit down now. Yeah, the big deal is even if Simplicity aren't getting those kills, and Hero's Hearth got the one kill on Greymane, they're still doing enough to damage Hero's Hearth and punishing that Uther solo support that Hero's Hearth have to go back and heal. And it's just enough time for them to set up this strong front line between the double warriors and then channel out that altars. As long as Simplicity continues to keep up with experience, though, that's important, that they can still make sure and have all of these possibilities for fighting and uh, being able to continue to contest the altars. That's one way that they may just be able to climb even further forward in this game over Hero's Heart. So far, they're doing a really good job. A lot of it has revolved around the Lunara counter towards Uther. I mean, the amount of damage, the amount of falling back that they've done has been tremendous. Hero's Hearth getting a little bit of a push in here, however. Greymane is very far forward. Looks like Tahaka and Falstad have their eyes on him. Goes in, he's gonna use uh, Arthalon to dive forward. Dodges the drag. Ishbu though down two, and with an isolation, just to be sure, Hero's Hearth will punish that. Punish they, they did. That's. You know, in the, in the previous fight, Zuna went in a little bit far by himself trying to get on the backside. He's pushing out a little bit too far. As somebody that's in the solo lane, you have to be a little bit more cognizant that rotations will happen like that, especially when you look at the fact that there's double global potentially. Exactly. All it takes, he did a good job initially to try and juke it, but all it takes is one disruption in your movement to where you just rotate the rest over and you're good. Hero's Hearth ever vigilant and using those wingman stacks at the top just as altars are about to activate. I'll go for the same practice as before. McIntyre stalking in. They'll keep Falstad up as long as they can. And they stop the channel in the mid. A really nice play by Hero's Hearth taking advantage of that gray main kill. The top as well. Now they're going in for a drag. They've caught K1 Pro. Goes into Ice Block. He's going into Ice Block. The stage thing? dive in return. And McIntyre is deep in there. He lands another Tongue Mouth. We're not able to get out, but we do get the trade onto Hanzo, and it's continuing. Yeah, BBJ is just about to fall down too. Goes out for one more heal, giving himself the armor, giving himself a little bit of healing, but it's not enough to save him. And Hosty doing his best with these poisons to give kills to Simplicity. Three kills for the Malfurion gained by Hero's Hearth equals another altar for Simplicity. But that top lane is starting to be a real threat to Simplicity now with the constant control over camps. Yeah, the lock-in there on the Malfurion. McIntyre just helped position the Sanctification, or excuse me, the Divine Shield that kind of kept him alive for the moment. There were just so many counters all in that, the stage dive, but everybody locked into that choke. Such a big power play for Simplicity. Yeah, it was a great Divine Shield from BBJ as the he was very likely to be going up against the Twilight Dream, knowing that everyone had crowded around Malfurion. Malfurion was going to go down, so he came out of the ice block and dropped the Twilight Dream. But even with that, using natural agility over the wall, it's uh, not so easy to run away from people like uh, Lunara with Leaping Strike, with an Eldruin from Tyrael. And Simplicity had no problem chasing him down to get that Hanzo kill. Hero's Hearth, just a tiny bit behind in terms of core health there, just four points behind. but. Right now, Simplicity needs to take this bottom bell tower. Because that top bell tower can lead to an early rotation or an easy rotation for Hero's Hearth to come down and reclaim the bot lane. If Simplicity can get the bell tower on the side of Hero's Hearth, then that means Hero's Hearth is just plain neutral. If they are able to hold here, and then the Hero's Hearth makes the play on the top bell tower, and then they also take control of the bottom, that's a big power play that could potentially come in for Hero's Hearth. So Simplicity, I feel like they need to try and be a little bit aggressive in that bottom lane, but in the top lane, 
That was beautiful. Yeah. Just such beautiful execution. As the isolation went out, barrel roll over the wall. You had the slow from that too. Airho was stuck with a lot of damage. Then the drag to finalize the kill. No air ho at the start of this phase is rough for Simplicity, especially as Falstad looking to bring down that. He might just die for it with the channel in the bottom for shots or in the mid. Oh, he barrel rolls out. I don't know if he's gonna get out of here alive. Twilight Dream stops the fly away. Hosty jumps on in for the kill. They take out Falstad, but the damage has been done to their core with two altars being channeled. That's got to feel bad because he didn't get away and, and he didn't get the bell tower. Exactly. I wondered if at that point he was just, just going to sacrifice go, yeah. himself. Yeah. That's a that's a tough spot to be in. He's like, well, maybe I can get out of here. Here's my last chance. But uh, the nice Twilight Dream keeping him locked in, confirming that kill, saves the top bell tower. Now Simplicity, as much as it is even, I feel like this game is still could go either way. And a lot of it revolves around the top and the bottom lanes here. And both of them have major potential in terms of what they can do with it. But Simplicity right here, right now, has Sappers pushing in. You know, much like we saw Heroes Hearth use this style of composition on Towers of Doom to get a win over Team 12, and the comp that they had played versus, I believe it was Gale Force, uh, we're seeing Simplicity do the right things to counter those globals. They have the ETC up in the top, and that has been slowing down the plans immensely from Heroes Hearth to t gain control of that top so that the globals can start to pressure on in the mid or elsewhere. And Simplicity have done a great job of commanding this bottom lane. And that is why we're seeing them being able to keep up so well with Heroes Hearth, despite a draft that we wondered, or at least I wondered, if Simplicity could keep up with, because in general, we've seen just stellar, phenomenal global play from Heroes Hearth in this kind of composition before. So far, I mean, still even. Core Health says so, but experience slightly in favor of Heroes Hearth. Double altar phase, but with that top lane control, they, oh, this is not a good spot. That's gonna be Greymane going down at a very inopportune time. Yeah, that seems to be the case. The couple of times that Heroes Hearth have found picks on Simplicity, always right before the dodge on the Dragon's Arrow does stop K1 Pro, and there's a Holy Ground too. Stage Dive as he comes in. Ishmu's gonna dive forward, separating himself quite a ways away from the rest of the team, but with McIntyre there too, that'll get some time for the rest of the team to come in. Twilight Dream as Falstad flew in, and he is gone, a one-for-one -one trade for that kill. McIntyre's trying to trade on the backside. K1 Pro just barely able to live, and now Urho's in trouble. He's gonna go down two members on Simplicity, but BBJ, he's gonna fall. Divine Shield did go out. The Ghost of Uther trying to heal up. McIntyre. He lives thanks to the Ghost of Uther and nobody channels on this altar. Heroes are they're playing with fire. And by fire, I mean poisons. Hosty <laughs> is really bringing it to Heroes Hearth. It is just a terrible feeling when you just see your health bar just slowly start to, and it scales incredibly well. It scales incredibly well. So that's done. Well, that, that's a little bit of a trade. Yeah, that happened. <laughs> so did that, K1. I, if I'm going down, I'm taking you with me. And so he did. A Lunara for Hanzo. All right, 19 to 19, we've got Sappers back up in the bottom and top, and Simplicity are doing their best to take back control of what was theirs. Heroes Hearth just doing uh, what they can to get Storm Talents, and this will help Simplicity get on the way to that too. King Capin looking to potentially sniff this out. He does have Holy Ground. I don't think his team can make it over. Well, excuse me, Stage Dive just gonna come right in. Uther just now spawning, no Hanzo here. It looks like Simplicity trying to make the power move. That was They're gonna get it. That was an isolation miss. Now the power slide, the roots underneath. Zuna going for the throat, takes down one. The root catches Ishbu too, forcing him into Avatar. Simplicity are going in. Zuna diving deep, King Caffeine right along for the ride, and Arrow keeping Ishbu down. Can he get back into the kill zone with that pierce of the Storm Bolt? It looks like yes, but just barely. Just barely. Now they've got to also defend the sappers. They're going to be pushing in. This could be major control here if they get these across. Hanzo is back, but he is nowhere nearby. And now this bottom lane, and we've seen how favorable this bottom lane is. Next altar phase, double altar phase in the bottom and mid. And it's triggering now, and this is a tough spot for Heroes Hearth to be in. 17 to 15 with five, if Simplicity can get both of these, it'll set them up really nicely for some future Sapper Camps, which there's one in the bottom lane already. And then possibly the boss, which teams, they have not really been too keen on. It's been all about the Bell Tower game, the Sapper control, the Altar control. 
But that can change in the blink of an eye. Yeah, who can blame him? I mean, it's just been a wrestle for control of this battleground. There's a stun onto Lunara. A little bit of scatter arrow damage coming in. ETC, however, getting a free channel in the bot lane in the meantime. And we've got a, a contest here over this next altar. And there's still sappers. This is going to separate out Heroes Hearth. King Caffeine has constantly been vigilant about this holy ground. BBJ gets separated from the rest of the team. Ishbu peppered with poisons. Falstad dealing with the sappers still. With the channel, Heroes Hearth backs off. They relent. This is just, I mean, it's such a close game. I mean, both these teams are in a very similar spot in terms of how they've been trying to control this battleground. Simplicity finally made the breakthrough. They got the bottom control back. I'm a bit surprised that they're going here. It appears that they could potentially be going for boss, then potentially sanctification to end on the next altar phase. That seems to be the play that they're trying to make right now. Yeah, they have that holy arena for the increased uh, damage, yes, but also the increased duration of an extra second. They also do have holy ground. And this can be a really scary place for them to fight into, but it seems like Simplicity is more just seeing if they can bait out somebody to step out of position, give them an edge in the team fighting, maybe just take the fight and then uh, be able to take the boss from there. I will say that if you're not going to make a huge play for that boss, then holding the bot lane would have been so much better. I mean, that is kind of the name of the game. We've seen a lot of teams make a play towards that bottom lane and that just be the biggest part of the way this, this map operates. And they were trying to get the boss. They wanted the boss, but somebody called it off, and they ended up giving the bot lane control away. That is, to me, a bit of a mistake here by Simplicity here in the late game, which was one of the things King Caffeine mentioned in his interview, was to shore up some of those late game decision makings. We'll see if it comes back to bite them. Yeah, and it also kept the team largely together, so they couldn't take full effect off of that ETC. Wanted to keep him along with the rest of the team. The Wisp is still there, keeping an eye on the boss. Bottom's going to push in thanks to those sappers, but Simplicity gets sappers closer to the altar phase. And that might be something that they can use to their advantage. Zoning away Hero's Hearth as that altar will be uh, in the mid. This is an another fight. Zuna going in very aggressive there, not able to get much damage. Gets a, a hammer to the face in return. Keep Caffeine using the Holy Ground to zone out. Dahaka, he's going to try and come in. He should be able to get there in time. The Dragon Arrow was eaten there, but on the backside, Malfurion going down. Yeah, the Dragon, he couldn't do anything to get into the Twilight Dream. He was stun locked for days between Hero's Hearth. Holy Ground trying to see if he could make a pathway of no resistance for ETC to run away. But Hero's Hearth got that kill too, and that's what they needed to do against this Lunara, because you can see the poison start to do too much thanks to the Splintered Spear. But in this case, Hero's Hearth get the initiation, the start, the jump onto Simplicity. They take two kills, and they get the altar setting it to 7 to the 10 of core health of Simplicity. Casually watch Hanzo. Four more shots. Just rip the boss to pieces. Simplicity getting some control back by getting their bell tower as well, but 7 to 6 core health here on Towers of Doom. It is a close one in game one. Closer than I uh, anticipated on this map between Hero's Hearth and Simplicity. I'm really impressed by Simplicity's play in this series. It seems like they have been uh, taking to heart the things that they needed to work on, and it's awesome to see in this game. But things are about to get more difficult for them because down in the bottom, Hero's Hearth finally able to get that bottom control. We've got a couple of sapper camps about to start. They need to turn their entire attention to that bottom lane. The next altar phase in the bottom. We look at potential Divine Shield ending later in the game. You need to make sure that you don't lose this for free. The next altar phase being in the bottom, you cannot afford to lose it for free. They need to push in here. They need to take this. Here's Hearth has a gust as a way of trying to allow these sappers to push in. And with the wingman, double the camp is double the shots, double the fun for Hero's Hearth if they can pull this off. Back behind them, Alter spawning in 20 seconds. This might be it if they can get these camps pushed in. One of these shots plus the Alter. Gust. The Gust. The Roots. K1 Pro is. Holy ground. They've got a hold. There's still three there. I don't think they're going to be able to make it to the Alter in time. No, they're forcing Simplicity to go all the way around the long ways. Dahaka's down dive. there. Arrow's going to stage dive on top of them. He got the stop. He got the stop for now. But now, is it too far? He bolts out. 
Ishbu, however, very deep on the side of Simplicity. He does have that healing static available. It's going to keep him alive, but the fight's going in quick. Sanctification saves Malfurion. Now he's going to use the Twilight Dream, only hitting the Muradin. In the back line, Zuna getting caught from the rest of Hero's Hearth, while Ishbu drew the fire away of the rest of the team long enough to give his team time. The flight in. Malfurion gone as Arthalon confirms that kill, and Hero's Hearth are chasing down Simplicity, taking them out as quickly as they can. Arthalon, nice play there. A little bit of... Quick movement at level 20 there. Hosty trying to make any play that he possibly can, unable to do so. But heroes are, they're holding. They're looking to potentially end the game by taking mid bell tower. They have five members to three. They don't have minions here just yet. This might be a bit ambitious, but they do have the tools to pull it off. We'll see if Lunara and Simplicity can hold here for now. Dahaka waiting in the wings, waiting to channel, seeing if they can take this. ETC has stage dive in nine seconds. If they can just hold on a little bit longer, maybe force Dahaka to have to use it, but Ishbu's going to keep an eye on that. They're going to watch and see if they can make sure to stop Arrow from going for the channel after taking out this bell tower. They go in, Hosty in danger, leaping strikes over. The channel has started for Dahaka in the bottom. It's too late for Simplicity to save their core. They will lose game one to Hero's Hearth, but Hero's Hearth, Man, it was a, a close game one. Uh, Heroes Hearth, I mean, they played it. It was like a kind of a slow and steady type style. They recognized they kept getting pushed down by the Lunara. It seemed like it pushed them off a lot of points that they would normally feel that they could take advantage of. And when they weren't able to take advantage of those, they had to fall back. Lunara was just putting too much pressure on. And then once they finally broke through that top lane, they were finally able to gain control. I'm a little bit surprised against Simplicity moving towards the boss, not making a hard play on the boss, giving up that bottom lane control. And Gilly, over the last two to three minutes, that bot lane control had uh, just big implications. Yeah. I, I was going to ask you, do you feel like that was the play that ended up costing the game for Simplicity? Do you feel like uh, it's, it's too hard to tell? I'm, there's a lot of variables, obviously, that go for into sure. Heroes of the Storm, but I'd say that's a big variable okay. to to just kind of forego there and that was a, a tough one for me to, to kind of watch it and then it ended up unfolding the exact way that you kind of thought could unfold it was like almost worst case scenario the next altar phase was the bottom two and then the last one was the bottom and it just puts you in a tough spot and by the time they were able to try and rotate around they just gave up too much control of the battleground they ended up losing it letting it slip through yeah it was sort of a hindsight is 2020 kind of thing uh, an ordeal for them, but it, it did end up costing not being able to have that bottom lane. Although, thankfully, at least for Simplicity, they had a lot of good tools to make sure that there weren't sappers escorted. And so they were trying as best as they can to keep uh, Heroes Hearts from being able to take that mid, which was the, the finishing blow to them. But it was, it was great to see them. Um, they knew that it was very likely that globals were going to be a factor for Heroes Hearth in that series and that draft. They made sure to get ETC, and Erho looked very capable as the ETC solo laner. In fact, it was Heroes Hearth who were struggling in the solo lanes to keep those solos alive. Yeah, we saw a lot of pressure early between the Dahaka Falstad, and then, of course, Falstad getting caught up in the top, not able to take that bell tower a little bit sooner. Right. And they did struggle to kind of really take maximum advantage. We thought they might be able to inch out a little bit more. Instead, they came up just a bit short. By the way, Hosty that game had 143,000 hero damage. 143,000 on Lunara. That is insane, by the way. It's Lunara. Lunara. You it's got Lunara. a lot of poisons. You got Splintered Spear. Uh, it worked super well mid-game, especially around the altars. Once she had that Splintered Spear, there were a lot of almost, you don't want to say free altars, but altars that they could take using that strategy really well. And that's something to keep in mind when you're playing that Lunara against Uther, uh, especially that you don't necessarily have to get the kills. It's just being able to push them back long enough that you can claim the objectives. He was looking at stats. He said, by the way, I'm third in North America in terms of hero damage per game. I'm also ninth in the world and hero damage per game. I want to bump those stats up. Obviously, that's not what they're playing for, but it definitely it shows you the- You don't know. I mean, it could be. <laughs> it, it goes to show the strengths that Hosty has had on this team, really doing it. A lot of times, we'll say the name Zuna in terms of being that strong backliner, but it's really been Hosty who's been the standout on that backside. That just goes to further, you know, kind of showcase things. Again, my, my biggest takeaway from that when it comes to that play, again, I, going into the draft and going into everything, the gray main play, Zuna gets way too aggressive at times, and he's splitting off from his team while they're focused somewhere else. They've got to shore that up, I think, to, to really get over the hump in these team fights. Well, uh, that will be simplicity.